Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the team meeting recording on Tuesday, October the 3rd, 2017. So just this weekend we came out of the, the workshop on the on the filament maker as well as the 12-inch uh, first-time build of the 12-inch D3D 3D printer. It was pretty good. Uh, once again, challenging. Once again, finding out a lot of good things about improvements and things like that. Yeah, like every time we build the printer, I find that there are definitely things we can improve on. It's it's one of those constant things. So in other words, the the final final version is not. I would say it's not stable at the very very uh, to the very level that we want it to be. Like for example, once again, like this time around, I noticed a lot of things about the extruder that I just don't like that are that make it hard. There were a couple issues, for example, on the extruder, like a thermistor was broken in one, a fan was broken in another. Um, we want to make that into more integrated design, just simplify that. That was, I would say, that was one of the trouble spots this time around. I'm going to sh uh, share my screen to show some of the results from this weekend, and uh, I posted a lot of that on uh, OSC Workshop's Facebook page, and we'll go from there. So today also we're going to have Connie join us uh, on HR issues. I'm sharing my screen here. At 1.30 we're going to have Connie join us. We're going to talk more about HR and how to develop the team. So here's, um, so intro would be the review of the 3D printer workshop, product demos like the Lyman Filament Maker. We're working on a CNC torch table, micro track, WebGL work. Uh, then we're going to get into HR with Connie and then work allocation. So here are hours of, of commitment. Uh, like for example, last week we were about 170 or so. Uh, which is we're hovering around four full-time equivalent as far as the actual uh, amount of work that's being done in the background on the project. So I'm going to go straight to the OSC Workshop's Facebook page just to show I posted a lot of the material on there as far as the meeting. Uh, do we have a note taker for today's meeting? Let's see. Anybody uh, could take notes? Uh, Abe, Roberto, Michelle... Um, who can take notes for today? Would, can we have somebody take notes? I, I can do the motion. Okay. Is that Josh? If you want notes taken just in this document. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please do. So there's notes here. So I set up a page on notes right here. And then I'm going to do a duplicate slide. I wanted to have Roberto fill in on the language agnostic instructionals, the new stuff he's doing. But uh, yeah, so so Josh, if you do that, like as I go into the the Facebook, um, the which is document is view only still. Oh, still okay. Let me change that there. And by the way, like if you guys see that the document has not been prepared for a certain meeting, then if you're going up there and check out the document, just create one from last week. What what I do is I take the last week versions, go to go to file make a copy and then put it into the the D3, the development log page on the wiki which is uh, the page called development team log just embedded in there so anyone can do that I don't have to be doing that anyone who sees that the thing is not up there yet please do so you know first check if it's up on the development team page and if it's not just uh, embed it in there by copying the old version from last week and then change change that to, to this week's as far as the Facebook page, I'm going to paste that into the chat box as well, Josh, so you can follow that. But, Josh, if you could just uh, paste in... Wait, what happened? Yeah, if you can paste in some of the pictures from the Facebook onto the corresponding pages on the wiki. So, a few things. So, this is the Live and Film and Maker. That's as far as we got. I mean, um, so, so Saturday we were building the printer. We got it largely done that that night and then in the morning we tested it we ran into some issues testing um, we actually started this at about 5 p.m. on Sunday and this is what we got to after four and a half hours of build time you can see a little quick video right above that um, hey, do we have, I still have uh, I need permission to get this document Oh, I'm sorry. Put anyone at open source again, public can edit. Okay, uh, see if you can do that now. Can find an edit. 
see if that changed to refresh that. And go ahead right in there. Sorry about that. Works now? Okay. Okay. So this is where we got to. So I must say the the build was very interesting. I mean, it was very nice to see a thing where we bought all the parts. We did a lot of good work on documenting it. All the parts we printed. Things fit beautifully. So it was amazing. It was it was one of those experiences where okay, you've got all the pieces that somebody else before us has developed and actually this is version 6 as far as Hugh Lyman he this is like his version 6 but it was nice to see like you got those 3d printed pieces then right in it we've got this temperature controller that snapped in the switches snap in there's all the right places for the knobs and buttons and electronics underneath it was sweet I mean everything like we didn't run into any trouble really um, toughest part so far has been maybe I don't know, drilling out the MDF block, so we cut, just with a hacksaw, cut off this little piece of MDF board insulator under, so this is the hot element here, that we don't have the heat element on it yet, but the auger is inside there, drilling out the metal in the, in the flange and then the MDF block, but otherwise, you know, things just fit together beautifully, like for example, the hex coupler right there for the auger, it just snaps in, the coupler snaps in on a motor, just by friction and it's a nice really nice fit so the experience was very pleasant in terms of things just working like we didn't have to you know like arrange stuff because oh it didn't fit or something uh, things were in the wrong place it was very well done so so really congratulations Hugh Lyman for paving the the way for us because it was quite pleasant uh, we did get to some of the other components such as uh, so there's some pictures, let's see, a little before here. Um, let's go through a couple more pictures just to show that, showcase what's happened. But look at this, I mean, so then the, you know, the digital display screen just snaps right in. Um, this is in the making as we're just gluing it, gluing gluing the structure together with with crazy glue, just little tubes of crazy glue, clamping it down. Um, this is the coupler going on the motor that's the very start that's the electronics um, not not all complete but pretty straightforward as far as that goes that's the heat barrel with a plug that's not been drilled out yet um, here's that MDF block with a bushing the the brass bushing inside of it which holds the the auger in alignment uh, here's initial gluing of the four big pieces of the electronics case. This is the winder. Uh, on the winder, we got the. It turned out one of the speed controllers on the winder was bad. So that's, you know, even if we had the time, we wouldn't be able to actually run the winding element because you need two motors one to run the tensioner, one to run the spooler. Part. one of those the thing right there one of those was broke broken it just didn't work so um, other than that very nice and sweet uh, very pleased with the build of course there's more to go on that uh, starting with a blank slate here yeah so very nice uh, comments on that yeah we have to finish that up sometime um, other questions were one one other fault in the build was I got the five eighths bit, that's the auger bit. Uh, it turned out that it, it was only 0.52 inches, which look looked like there was definitely a bad part we got shipped it was probably wrong because it looked more like a like a nine sixteenths bit than um, than a five eighths bit. You have to be about 0.6 inches for the diameter of the of the auger bit um, let's see what else to show on that you can see the little tiny video here of the auger spinning so it's a very powerful motor spinning this shaft very slowly so that's pretty nice you can see that just initial initial testing here 
And so then what we're doing here is just we've got the speed controller and uh, we're testing we're turning the knob. doing some initial testing on a system. Everything was working. So we went forward. And um, what else what else to say about that? Pretty good. Um, good deal. Uh, very very pleasing experience and then so I'll go right from there so before that we did the build of the printer here's I just caught a quick video at the very end printing out a column with the first iteration of the 12 inch printer so that's how it goes that this was done in like 20 minutes for this whole thing to come up with a nice uh, you know a nice 12 inch by 12 inch bed which makes it very very nice in terms of the large size that you can just print more things on it at the same time so say when you're printing parts to, to build a printer at best we would fit all the parts on one bed I, I doubt it it's that's not possible unless we had them stacked vertically but it definitely makes it easier that for every uh, you can just get so many more parts on at the same time which is really good so that's good um, more updates uh, just one update on the on the tractor here. So Roberto did the bucket. Um, that's that's good. That looks looks pretty nice. I mean that that as is, I think we can build. Uh, it does not have the mount for the the quick attach. This quick attach is actually reversed here. That's an old tractor. I put it on here, but this bucket as is, I think we can build that identically I think the geometry is good it's rather long in terms of size that means it can carry a lot I guess the concern here would be if you're carrying a lot on that the weight balance would probably tip you forward um, given the size of the the micro track here like without counterweight on the back this bucket would would have too much weight but we might put some counterweight on the back and make this work for carrying just a lot of large things. It will be easy to put counterweight as the, there's going to be a platform on the back of the micro tractor and we can put weights on that you know like maybe a couple of hundred, three hundred pounds or so to carry the weight of this extra bucket. That's good. Um, moving on. We're also progressing on a CNC tow ship, so this is from Ahmed. We're we're doing the redesign of the. So this is the larger carriage for for using one one inch rods within the the universal axis assembly. Still using a small. Well, actually, this piece can mount different types of motor sizes, so you can have small NEMA 17, then 23 and 34. I'm actually only seeing two holes sizes here, but this is we're reworking the torch table for the the October 14, 15 build. So I think right now what we'll do is do a um, a version that's five by five feet just to keep it simple. Because because the thing is uh, we can work with one inch rods with one inch bushings very readily. But if we want to go, we said that we we noticed that if you go to 10 feet long, it gets too heavy. So I think we'll just restrict it to five by five feet. And make it work that way, because otherwise you have to you have to develop a a different system for for the carriage to work properly, because they don't make like 1.05 inch bushings that would fit three quarter inch standard pipe, like black pipe that could be used for lighter weight and still the the same same heaviness, uh, same well same ability to carry a much larger. Uh, distance without bending and being correct so in the background we have um, so Cedric actually he piped it back up but he's still gonna do the the finite element analysis so for example on uh, on a torch table we can take okay here's our one inch shafts we can actually simulate be, like like for example in a build we found that the one inch shafts were bending maybe like I don't know maybe like one inch or so at the middle maybe one and a half inches that's the kind of thing we can actually pick out in FreeCAD when we say, okay, the span of those one-inch shafts su suspended by either end is uh, the weight is so much, and then it will bend so much according to the finite element analysis calculations in FreeCAD. So if in FreeCAD we saw that, okay, that's going to bend like one inch to two inches, we would just not do it in the first place. 
and actually save ourselves a bunch of work. So that's a way to parallel some of the work instead of just trying it out. We could um, calculate it more exactly within FreeCAD or even do basic deflection calculations. You can actually do that on paper. You can say based on the weight of steel and using a formula for deflection like a rod suspended on two ends. There, there's little formulas that you can kind of pull this off tables but that's that's useful to do um, and FreeCAD could, could let us do that more effectively without having to go through the calculations. We just put it into FreeCAD and make it happen. So what else? Uh, Roberto, can you tell us, um, uh, I saw in your log you're talking about a better way to do language agnostic instructionals in extraction of the actual isometric views. Can you tell us a little bit about it or is your sound working? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, I, I, I tried to to upload a, um, an image but it was too large. Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't upload the uh, maybe I, I can put a screenshot, but it's yeah. the same. Of, finally, it's the same of the the last images of the past um, team meetings. Yeah. And well, the 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 new thing now is that um, uh, the image is um is a PNG, but it is obtained from an, an SVG file. So. The, the workflow now um, once we we have the the shape 2d view object do you remember yep. that okay so once we have that that object um, instead of uh, taking a screenshot mm -hmm. uh, now I we, we can export uh, select the object and Export as a flattened SVG. Flattened SVG. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we can open the, the, the SVG in Inkscape and <coughs> and change the the line width and then PNG. And this, this avoids the the jagged edges, the pixelation. Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's good. Now, what's let, let me see. What's different than the procedure before? So before, just if you can summarize the difference before, you were going through the, the. Uh, t okay, tell us the difference because I'm, I'm forgetting what the difference is between this and and what we did before. Uh, before you mean the lie the lie yeah. agnostic instructional. Yeah, like yeah. when we were extracting um, the the isometric views before, it was we had to like, first of all, do the yeah. another workbench. So the tell main us. difference is is that we uh, now we we don't need to use uh, the macro that mm -hmm. we used before. Okay. So do you, uh, if you remember in that macro, we yeah. uh, we get a lot of images or piece of views from different angles. Yeah. And now we 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 can get only the 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 view that we want and immediately. Um, carry that view to the SVG and to the Inkscape okay. uh, software and then Excellent. we can export as a PNG. Okay, and then you can do different things like you can export one part, you can export a compound of many so you, can, you have all the flexibility? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's very f flexible because yeah. you can, the only th the only thing that you you, you need uh, to do in FreeCAD is to get that um, shape to the view object. If you okay. if you can get that object, you can export as a PNG as as a as a SVG file and then as a PNG and then that that's the the, the only uh, critical step that we need to to do in FreeCAD. Okay, so you think this probably will, will supersede the former language agnostic instructional extraction of the ISO views, so we'll do it this simpler way from now on, you'd suggest? Yeah, I think because it's easier and we, we get the, the same result. Excellent. Yeah, that's really good.
Would you mind doing like a one minute video just to show this workflow on a screen capture? Yeah, yeah. That would be good. That. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. I mean, as you see, guys, we're all developing the methods and streamlining them so we can use the best best features of FreeCAD. And FreeCAD is pretty complex altogether. So it's got all these things that we don't know about yet until we, we really open source it for the whole team. That's good. Excellent. Uh, let's move on to, thank you, Roberto. And then, so actually what I'm going to be looking at with Roberto is we're going to have him start prototyping on on some parts as well. We're going to send a 3D printer out to him so he can get involved more in the prototyping side. So that's We'll look forward to that. And eventually, like that's what we should do. Like All of us should have access to, to the development capacity that we can do basic prototyping wherever we are so we can spread that effort uh, throughout the world and, and we can really accelerate the development process. Because like right now, like when we're, for example, prototyping the CNC torch table, it could be something that we can be doing in parallel in different locations. We can, all it would cost is, you know, a few dollars to, to to send some or acquire some parts but the good thing is is we're using a lot of very similar parts like and if one has access to a 3d printer you can literally for maybe like fifty dollars or even less build a torch table because you can pick off the you know we are using the same same uh, stepper motors same controller for the CNC torch table and all of that so so with minimal modification we can go from one machine to the other and and we're try we're gonna try to be clever of how we select the minimum set of parts in our developers kit such that you can do just about anything um, with the parts that we already have and then you can bootstrap up to larger machines and so forth so we'll explore how that works all together okay I, I see some good activity happening on a blender webgl michelle can you t tell us about that Yeah, I'm uh, still working on it. Uh, I ran into some uh, code issues. Uh -huh. I'm not so familiar with Python, so uh, I'm learning Python while I'm making the add-on. Python? Uh, Python, yeah. It's uh, programmed in Python and uh, the Blender AP, uh, API. Uh, and yeah, it's quite uh, it's, uh, it's an experience. It's, uh, uh, but I'm learning a lot, and I, uh, it will be useful in uh, making add-ons for uh, for FreeCAD also. So I made a screenshot of the the panel. Um, wow, is that panel programmed in Python? Yeah. So so uh, Lex knows Python. He can help out. Um, well, maybe because uh, I'm I'm a beginner. Sometimes uh, the the code maybe is a bit. Uh, 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 it could be more Un and more unprofessional. Uh, what? Unprofessional. We like it that way so that more beginners can understand it too. Yeah, but anyway. Well, uh, but I'm I'm learning to to work with loops and things like that to to compact. Uh, but yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm adding comments also in the code, so yeah. uh, other people can work more easily on it. But if you look at the functionality, it's made, uh, it's uh, custom made for uh, uh, importing uh, free cats. Yeah. If you if you export a free cat uh, assembly uh, an OBG file. Um, OBJ, yeah. The, uh, OBJ, yeah. Um, the names um, um, underscore zero one is added to all the, com uh, the the component names. So I added like a, a button to remove uh, the underscore zero one uh, from all the names. So I, I put in some uh, additional um, functionality, like all the spaces are replaced uh, with underscores when you export, and you can correct that again with a replace underscore button. Uh, then uh, explode all, all the pieces, go um, explode on all the axes, but sometimes uh, you want, want it to explode more on the x-axis, like uh -huh. the human extrusion. Then you can correct that with the buttons uh, x-explode and y-explode. And oh, wow. you can move the parts individually, so uh, by clicking them and moving them, until you have something that, uh, that you're uh, satisfied with. Wow. Uh, and then you can make um, visibility groups 
when you click prepare visibility groups, uh, ah. not 19 additional render layers are, uh, are made and couples to layers. Wow. Now, the reason, the reason why I did that is because you can give a render layer a name, but you can't put uh, objects in it. But you can put objects in layers and couple the layers to the render layers. So that way uh, you can put objects huh. in, a, in a group and give it a specific name. Wow. Uh, yeah. But uh, that, that functionality, uh, I ran into some issues, uh, but I have some code snippets that work, so I have to implement them in the, in the total code. And yeah. then uh, the bottom uh, is a save to GS file. For the moment, it's only the, the positioning code with the, with the name of the, the components that export correctly. The visual, uh, the visual visibility groups uh, don't export correctly for the moment. So, yeah, so there's still some work on it. Okay, well, excellent. So, so as you see in the comments, Lex can help on that. His, his email. Okay, thanks. Thanks. What? Christian uh, uh, is very busy with the ISO, uh -huh. so he doesn't have too much time to, to spend on the Python code. Uh, yeah. He, yeah, he did some great stuff with the JavaScript code. Yeah. Hey Lex, that would be a good thing to prioritize, man, if you want to do that, because this is like mission critical right now. This is good uh, documentation related. So Lex and I were also talking about uh, Dunitor, which is an alternative uh, uh, cryptocurrency for OSE. And actually, my latest thought on that is uh, timing. I don't, I'm not sure timing is right for that. I think the timing for, for uh, cryptocurrency development, which we're going to do. I mean, we're going to create our, you know... the in the future, there's going to be be uh, more economic creation when people can tap cryptocurrencies or alternative currencies for for their their use as opposed to centralized money system. That's just a natural thing that I think is going to happen more in the future. But the timing has to be like like Lex said, it's easy to create a cryptocurrency. What's hard is to actually make it valuable. So for OSC case. I think that it will be very valuable once there's a lot of replications coming online and we have real economic power uh, really going on in a major way. Like right now, you know, myself and maybe another person are the only people on this planet that are doing full-time OSC work and getting their livelihood from it. But once we get like 5, 10, 100 people actually doing that, uh, maybe like at the point of like 12 or 24 people, getting their full livelihood from OSE, that's when I think would be the right time for a cryptocurrency development where um, something like Dunitor or something else where we can definitely back it up with tangible value and it can spread at a at a better rate. That's my thought on that at this point, just to share that. But yeah, can, can I just add really quickly? Um, yeah. I, I've been talking a little bit to the uh, uh, guys who are working on Dunitor. Uh, and one thing they said is it still is kind of a, a new thing. You know, they're still developing it. So right now there's only one currency that exists and they feel like it's still kind of in beta level. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's definitely right now is not the time uh, to use it. But I was thinking maybe at the beginning of next year we can do like a test coin and then through the year we can kind of see how it works and kind of get the, get the hang of it. And then maybe in 2018 is when we can really do um, kind of a, a more uh, stable one. So yeah, yeah it's definitely a long-term thing. But... There's also going to be a lot of learning and stuff, and it's one of those things where if you screw up and you lose your wallet, then you know you lose the, the coins. So, so it's good to have like a one-year trial run, and then after that, switch to the real thing. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay, we've got. Uh, so do we have Connie joining us here online? Connie, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Connie, so so we'd like to have. Um, thank you, Connie, for joining us again. And we'd like to have a continuation of the HR, the basically guerrilla recruiting stuff, how we can all be involved in, um, make it easy for everybody to, to recruit and get more people on a team. So with that said, let's have um, Connie again, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen and, and continue the presentation where we left off from last time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, on. Are you able to see my screen? Let me see here. Um, I'm not not yet. Let's see. My 
But let's see, something disappeared here. Let me see. Hold on just a sec. Um, can people see see Connie's screen? Let me stop sharing mine. Yeah, Gibson sees the Hall of Mirrors. I don't I think everybody else can see it. Uh, let me see. I'm going to just Hall of Mirrors. I'm trying to... The icons are not showing up for me for people's different screens. Let me just refresh. Okay. I think we got it. Okay. Uh, let's see, Connie. Are you sharing sharing your screen right now? I I am. I am not seeing it, unfortunately. Let me see if I can cut my camera. Uh, can you paste a link to your document, and we can follow that because I am just not able to see your screen right now. Would right. you mind pasting that in the chat, which is on the left hand side, if you click the the text box there? Um, then you can just go on on your document. We can all click into your document mm -hmm. and then we can follow on our own screens even though we can't see it on the main screen. Okay, I put the link in there. Let me know when you want me to start talking. Okay. Excellent. Um, I see it. That's really good. And which page would you like me to start to point to go to? Um, let's see. This is my. Uh, let's just start on fourteen and just kind of. Um, Summarize very quickly what, Excellent. We, what we've talked about so far, and then we'll push forward. Okay, ready. You can go right ahead. I've got it on my screen and recording it for anyone who misses it by any chance. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Well, thanks for having me back. Sorry, uh, I went into the abyss for about a week. You know, life happens. So, mm -hmm. but I'm back on track, and I'm glad to be here with you guys. So, um, you know, previously we had gone over, you know, kind of a foundation context of why we recruit and how to recruit and why recruiting social media is so important. We also talked about some more tactics on target recruiting, um, concentric circles, power of associating, so on and so forth. But ultimately, that bottom line message was we're a core of people that can share our story, share the experiences of being part of open source ecology through, you know, I'll call it storytelling, you know, mm -hmm. via the web, via pictures and text and talks and so forth. So the, the screen that I have up now, I think that was, this was kind of highlighting uh, in, I think we were on Instagram, um, which I received, uh, March, and thank you for creating that spreadsheet to track everybody's social media accounts. Some, some of you are active and some are not, and it's cool, um, but I'm, I encourage you to start getting more socially active and partake in this. Um, it'll be a, a powerful it can be a powerful thing. Um, so um, I had reached, recently talked about, you know, why we hashtag and you know, just to review this slide a little bit, hashtags are um, a, a way to, you know, it's another way of flagging. So if anybody does a search function, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull to that. Um, and it also it helps people find content to follow and actual people to follow. Also that at username 
um, is always important to put in any post um, because it's also, you know, um, it, it, if you're responding to somebody or you're grabbing somebody's attention, it's going to ping them so they know that they're men mentioned in a message um, to that extent. Okay, and now I, I grabbed this off of the internet, and this is um, uh, AT and T Life at AT and T, and it's another it's an engagement campaign that they do. So you, you see these gentlemen up on the pole, like this is an action shot there at work, similar to the one that we have of marching over the hydroponics and whatnot in the garden. Um, again, it tells a story of you know, so somebody that's not there in the in the flesh can can kind of see it and smell it and breathe it and get excited about being a part of it. And again, you know, not, not all of us are, are great writers or anything like that or super creative, um, but it, it doesn't take a lot. It's really just showing a moment in time and what you're thinking and feeling and working on, and you're just kind of sharing it with the world. Yeah. All right. So um, I had pushed you guys, I think, at the end of the last presentation, you know, how to set up on Instagram if, if you're not sure how. And this wiki how is a very step by step, and again, I'll offer my my um, time and, and willingness to help anybody that wants to set up an Instagram uh, account. We can do a sidebar chat, and I can share screens and we can set up accounts if you if you want. And again, a list of hashtags and the the at uh, username. And Martian, I think you updated the um, OS. HR kit that you copied and pasted some of the some of the key hashtags and recruiting messages, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, we can all edit that. Um, you know, as we speak here, I'm actually editing that right now. For example, putting in the presentation right here. Um, yep. Perfect. Okay. So I'm I'm tabbing forward. I'm now on the the, the first slide of the, the Twitter. But some of you are already active, and some of us voyeur, we hop on Twitter Twitter and kind of see what's going on. You can't get away with it, uh, away from it in, in our society. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty um, main communication tool. But again, some fun facts. So, you know, when you think about it for recruiting purposes, 55% um, of people that are on Twitter follow companies because they want to know more about it. 34% are applying to tweeted jobs that are, that are job posted. Um, using Twitter, and 33% of us use Twitter to communicate with companies and recruiters. So again, it's just part of the, the fabric of our society now. This is um, a main communication tool. And OSC has 10.9 thousand followers. That's fantastic. That's a, a huge force. So every time that we you know, do a personal tweet, you know, and we hashtag open source ecology or at OSC uh, ecology, um, it, it's, it just it forks out and, and it hits anybody that's already a follower because um, also uh, OSNE can pick it up and retweet it, if that makes sense. Yeah. They're all with okay. And just to show you an example, like, you know, building the HR team, I, I believe I have a feed from YouTube, so when I posted it on YouTube, it automatically appeared on Twitter. I, I believe that was automatic, yeah. Yeah, you mm -hmm. definitely, there's a lot of the uh, social media platforms are integrated, uh, so you can check box to, if you post on Facebook, it automatically goes to Twitter, you post on LinkedIn, you can automatically link your account so it's pushed to Twitter, so it's all intermingled, so you don't yeah. have to do the same action twice. Okay, and then uh, the next slide I have is just the um, OSC recruiting Twitter, it's just the black background again, how to set up your Twitter account um, if you uh, don't have one yet. Um, and there's so many tutorials, even, you know, when you go to twitter.com and you start setting up your account, it's, it's very user friendly on how to get followers and how to follow people. So it ha has its own built in tutorial. Um, again, it's all about engaging and sharing meaningful content. And it's, the, the goal is to, to create awareness and make people act, to make them want to be part of OSE. Um, so the more photos and videos and, and the more you're talking about it, um, the more people engage. Again, it's, it's like having a conversation. You know, I put an example on this slide to ask a question. And again, I'm, I, I just don't even know where I pulled some of this stuff when I created it. But, I, you know, you pose a question out there and get people talking. 
Um, and I use the example, uh, don't laugh at me, please. I'm not, I'm not a subject matter expert. So what do you think, of, what do you think the load arm geometry on the, I don't even know how to pronounce that, the microtractor should be, question mark. Microtractor. Yeah, you're, you're, you're pushing out uh, a question to start the conversation. Um, that's, that's an example of a perfect question. I mean, that's a live question. It's like, okay, the geometry on that loader arm has to be perfected and, and feedback on that is great. Like, for example, what if uh, a guy who's an actual machine designer who, do, who does that pipes up and we get him on a team? That's, that's the goal of any kind of a, of a posting. Like, we're, when we're posting, we're basically fishing, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So this might be a good uh, example to, to copy and paste into the kit. Um, and it can be modified, but the, the goal is to, you know, take a look at the, how the question is, is, is posed and then all the, the supporting, um, the hashtag, the, the at username, and then also, you know, I threw in a link there to YouTube where you guys are actually talking about that design process. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, exactly. No, that's, that's a perfect post. That's a great post right there. Mm -hmm. Somebody should, somebody should own that, grab it, post it, do it. <laughs> right, if right. I, people are going to be like, why isn't the HR person wanting to know this? <laughs> right. So, yeah, if I go into that, so that's an example since you already... Okay, so l let me give you an example. So when you seed a good comment like that, um, so I can do that right now and I can go to... So if you... Let's see, am I... I'm not sharing my screen, but I, I'm going to Twitter.com right now. I copied and pasted it. What's happening? Copy paste. So basically, one person can be the copywriter, and another person can be the poster. So that'll be a a good thing. Now the only thing is on Twitter, um, I actually can't tweet it because it's too long. So um, you might have yeah. to. Yep. Pull out what's not relative or... Yeah, so I'm going to trim it down and now tweet it. So basically I went to, what do you think the loader arm geometry on a micro tractor should be? I put the put the video and then oh, at open source ecology, hashtag tractors for all. There you go. Tweet it. So that's an example. So so one person can write, like the, the more knowledgeable people can write stuff and we can have like a repository of relevant... Uh, tweets and quotes and all that and actually you can automate all of them like I was looking into can you automate Twitter Facebook Instagram yeah you can schedule posts so we can have a whole string so we can actually get pretty like automated robotic with that that we carry a constant conversation in the background as we're doing our stuff in the foreground yeah absolutely mm -hmm. now that tweet that you just did anybody that's active on Twitter should pick it up yeah and they should, they should go ahead and read retweet and make sure they include the same hashtag um, and the, the at username. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I'll, I'll pick it up and I'll push it. And anybody that's following me um, can push it up to you. So, again, perfect. Yeah, that's um, an example. Let me keep going here. <clears throat> um, okay, and then I just had some closing comments about, um, there is, you know, I, I, I keep saying it, it's about sharing meaning meaningful content to activate people, get them involved and encourage them. So anything, any of you um, on the team that are working on, you know, different aspects of the pro project, that's your moment and that's your story yeah. to share and questions to pose out there into the world. Um, also, you know, events, you know, upcoming workshops, you know, there's always should be a big push. Um, you know, that we can all just pick up, retweet, you know, and post or ask the question, hey, I'm going to be at the such and such, you know, workshop. Are you going? It's this date, this time, you know, again, it's just conversational. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Um, let's see. So um, moving a couple things about recruiting on Twitter. Um, it, it doesn't have to um, be... A dissertation or, or complicated it's a snappy call out um, and include a link uh, where people can apply um, now March and I'm sorry can you refresh my memory did I post out that that um, that uh, link for orange uh, 
HRM, the new application site. I don't recall mm, that. No, that no. The thing is, so if you have any questions like that, that should go to like HR log or Connie log. Uh, so, okay. so whatever you're doing, like you should log it. So, so then we can say, okay, I know Connie's working on it. Let me look, check on our log to see where that is. Because a lot of times it's, yeah, we just wrote orange HRM, but we don't have a link there. Okay, so, I will um, yeah. I will get that updated by end of day today, um, and I'll so everybody if you go into my log this evening you'll see I'll put in a, a a shortened link where you can always include in your recruiting tweets or when you're talking to people about joining the team to push them to it's a it's a summary of what the job entails or what the the, the assignment entails plus additional um, information, how to get to the wiki page and, and so on for, uh, so on and so forth. Um, yeah. And again, you know, when you're doing recruiting, short, snappy messages, whatever, don't forget the hashtags and the, the at tags. Um, right. Because the just, just for reference for everybody, our main goal right now is to get an HR person, build an HR team so we can actually actively recruit people because as, as I said many times, we can actively, like for example, go on YouTube and find relevant related projects, people who are working on stuff and they're actually documenting stuff that they're doing. So you know that they're actually doing something. We can just reach out to them and say, hey, come on, you know, join us or can you help us on this or that? And we can have an active process of looking for people like that across all areas of endeavor. So uh, HR is important. All right, um, I am now on slide 21 in case anybody wants to know where I'm at in the presentation. And it's just another example of just a quick hit, quick post of, you know, how to um, try and recruit. All right, now I'm going to move into LinkedIn. And some of you are already on LinkedIn, and I'm, I, I've connected with you. There's a few on the team. But I encourage you, um, not only for your professional development, but um, you know, for not only for OSME, but also for your professional development and engagement. LinkedIn is it's a, a mighty powerful network of like minds out there in the world, and it it just spans, it, it touches every possible industry in existence. So um, again, I encourage you to get on there and set up an account. Um, but with LinkedIn, it's, it's, it is more of a professional. I mean, you can get, you can be fun and witty and whatnot and conversational on LinkedIn. However, it's a different type of audience. Um, but um, you can post on your own network um, into groups that you join. Um, and again, it's going to impact the thousands and thousands of members. You can also directly uh, connect with uh, individuals of your choice. So if you are an engineer and you only want to, you know, be networked in with engineers, um, you just, it's in the search box, if you just type in engineers, you'll get a trillion hits of, of, act, of active LinkedIn members in that, um, in that trade or industry. Um, okay. So um, I included a, another, um, I'm on slide 23. Um, how to connect and start building your network. Again, here's a wiki, uh, a wiki how page, how to set it up. Also, LinkedIn is also very user-friendly and set up like Twitter. Once you start building your account, it just walks you down the path as kind of a built-in tutorial how to get started and how to search for people. Um, but I just took a couple screenshots to, to illustrate up in the search. I just typed in open source ecology. Now, OSE already has a LinkedIn page, um, so everybody should you're not already connected to it, get connected to it. Um, again, it's a, it's a very easy place to exchange and pick up messages. Um, let's see. Uh, here's a, another uh, example that I pulled. I typed in open source engineering. Um, there's 374,000 results. Um, but I just did a quick screenshot on some of the Whoa, folks here. Look I've at already that. reached out and started yeah. connecting with some of these folks. Um, hmm get them into my network and start talking to them about open source, uh, we call it OSE. Yeah, comment on open source engineering, I think it means open source software engineering, like a lot yeah. of that, but we can find some, yeah, they'll, they'll be at least related to our area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a, a, there's, yeah, your paths cross in one way or another. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's see, and then I wanted to show you just, you 
know, a, a quick screenshot of, you know, it, it, posting on here is just like Twitter or Facebook. It all has just the same type of text box that you start talking in. And what I wanted to show you is the post settings. Um, so you, have, you can control it a little bit. If you link your Twitter account, once you post on LinkedIn, it pushes it to Twitter. Um, you can blast this publicly so anybody on or off LinkedIn can see it. Or you can only post to certain connections, you know, certain groups uh, in your in your network. So there's some uh, there's some flexibility there. Um, let's see. Um, I, I, sorry, I'm just I illustrated um, how to, to share. So once somebody posts um, and you see it, it's just like retweeting. You're sharing it. You can just pick it up and push it out to your network of people. Um, and I demonstrated this. I picked up the um, off of the OSC LinkedIn homepage um, the volunteer HR position, um, and I pushed it to my network. At the time, it, I, I posted this like a couple of days after. After I already had 297 people took a look at it. Um, it's it's much more than that now. But again, it just illustrates the power of people like, huh, clicking, reading, thinking. You know, so it's. Um, it's a good resource. Yeah. All right. The the last couple things I have here is just a, a other examples of how recruiters use LinkedIn. Again, it's very basic, um, and it's you know it doesn't have to be super witty. Um, this is a very generic one from Mandarin Oriental Hotel Hospitality Industry in Las Vegas. Um, you know, she Jennifer just uh, posted this. Ha she did a hashtag job hashtag job because she also pushed pushed this to Twitter and if you're ever on Twitter and you just type in hashtag job you'll see you know it'll be just a million jobs will come up um, but again it's another way to tag it so people are looking for jobs anyway, um, that again, hashtag hold on you said that hashtag travels to Twitter hashtag or? is it's it's recognizable by Twitter so people um, so this this post okay. that she did on her LinkedIn account, she pushed it to Twitter. She used hashtag job in case okay. anybody's on Twitter and just types in job. And how do you share it on, can you share from from LinkedIn to Twitter? Like when you share, you can share to Twitter? Correct. So okay. um, if you go back to uh, on slide 25, when you are typing in the text box and oh, saying yeah. something, your post setting options have public plus Twitter. Okay. So, the, so it just automatically pushes it out. Yeah. Now once you click on public plus Twitter, um, if you don't already have your Twitter account connected, it takes you right down the path. It'll show, it'll tell you what to do to do uh, step by step to get uh -huh. your Twitter. And really that's just, it's just signing in with your Twitter handle and your password and ta-da, you're done. It's okay. now connected. Yeah. Um, all right, I am on the last page of the presentation, and it's really just next steps. I'm on slide 28, um, and so our, our kind of our overarching next steps is make sure all of us are connected to each other's social media, um, and so it's easy to share. So um, if, if anybody pulls out of the you know the you know the depository of messages, or if you see me pushing something out, you can just you're already connected to me, so you can just grab it and push it out also. Um, I owe you guys a group email um, with easy messages, copy and paste. However, Marcin, would you like us to continue to use the HR kit page? Yeah, or do you want yeah, definitely. Just put put that all there so we know that we know it's HR, HR kit and Connie Log. Those are two recognized pages for HR stuff. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, uh, the ATS announcement, um, let me just cover that briefly. So the AT ATS means application tracking system. So any of you here online that have applied for a job online before, it's all running on a, you know, a, a system behind the scenes. You know, we went out and found an application tracking system that also is an applicant, a participant in open source. So it's an open source application tracking system. Um, for HR, or it's really it's built for um, you know small to medium sized companies or startup companies. Um, so we now have an official 
page where it has the job summary and any additional information. Now, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on the back side with, um, you know, it's the administrator access. Um, however, it just makes it very easy one-stop shopping for anybody that may be interested. You get a quick hit of what the summary is. They can go ahead and uh, connect. They can, uh, sorry, upload their resume, um, and then that will generate an email to uh, our open source HR email account, and we can pursue that candidate and start engaging. Um, yeah, and then again, the key resources, we have the OSE HR kit, um, which has the sample uh, messages that are prepared for us, and I'll continue to add to it, and anybody else, you're more than welcome to participate, and, and again, you know, throw up some questions and ideas up there. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of it, Martin and team. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. So, uh, do we have, uh, do we have any questions? for Connie right now. Um, okay, so <laughs> what are some of the next steps we're taking here? So uh, to summarize that part, what, what we can get engaged in, and it's all, it's all a matter of time, so how do we use our time effectively? Connie, so what are some of the key things we can take out of this? Set up yeah, our, I mean, yeah, the go ahead. A couple things is uh, a couple things are um, you know if, if you're not connected in a social media, overwhelming. It, it, it's only ridiculous and overwhelming if you let it be. Um, you're fully in control, so I encourage all of you to get account or LinkedIn or Instagram, not personally, but just for the OSC cause. It's fine. Um, you know, and then you can just control it and use it as just, you know, another tool in your toolkit um, for whatever projects you're working on and, and um, you know, pushing out messages on behalf of OSC. So the first step, I, I would encourage everybody to get social media accounts. Secondly, if you want help, um, individual help from me, please just reach out. I'm, I'm more than happy uh, to help anybody that, that would like. I can... Um, so, yeah, okay, so what I would, I would say, yeah, set up your media accounts. I mean, just about anyone has at least some account. But I think the critical thing is, so let's use the OCHR kit as our critical page to look at. So if you go to the wiki OCHR kit, I mean, you just paste that uh, right in there. What we should have, have there is uh, that's our central repo, repository of all kinds of info. So what we want to do is our little... Um, little messages, little key copy that we use. We can always go to that page and pick out one line out of there, like just, just cool quips and lines that we can at any time post regarding HR activity. Like, we're always looking for new talent, uh, join our team by becoming an OSC dev or a subject matter expert advisor. You know, like, uh, we should have a repository so people don't have to think about uh, what, what copy to write. So maybe Connie, I, th I think you're collecting a bunch of quotes like that, right? You're you're yeah, working on the, that. I'll take the lead on that and get a foundation built out. I'll get five or six more messages posted up there. Yeah, yeah, that'll be good. I mean, yeah, as long as we have a little uh, a place where we can pull from, just to start organizing that, and then as anyone else joins the team, we can have them continue on that and, and just, just have a resource that people are not starting from zero. I think that's that's a very important part. And using, just adding hashtags all over the place to to posts, like anything you're posting, like like I'm going to hashtag open source ecology to build a hashtag open source tractor, you know, just, just start hashing everything. <laughs> so right, we right. can, uh, you know, that, that kind of deal. Hashtag this rules. Okay. <laughs> Hashtag Connie, thank you for doing this. <laughs> okay. You know, there's a, there's a really great opportunity. I know you guys just came out of a workshop this last weekend, yes? Yeah. Yep. That's right. So the, the, we're, we're primed right now to get people talking about what was just, what just occurred and what mm -hmm. just accomplished. Some of the highlights, the challenges, anything that you can share to generate that interest. Um, you, you've got some, 
you have some power or power right now to push out there coming right out of this workshop. So yeah. you know, if you have photos or anything that you can get up and, and post, I can I can push. Yeah, like uh so in addition to myself posting a lot of stuff, like some of the HR kit content should be what are some of our key assets? Well I have a a uh Google Drive of pictures. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I'm actually po posting that right now because even if you didn't go to the event, we always take a lot of pictures and I make folders of, of pictures available. So that's another thing you can pull from if you're, if you're bored, take a picture and post it. Hey, look at this. Look at this action shot from uh, Google Drive. So Google, I put it all on Google Photos and that's a way it actually goes directly from my phone into Google Photos. So anyone else can can use that as well. So we should do that. And in fact, um, you know, other people, if you want to to post your Google drives out there, if you're taking OSC related pictures and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's another thing to do. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um... Yeah. So yeah. No, that's good. And then, then so we'll continue continue on this and and meet Connie are you are you available tonight at seven still to absolutely I'd okay. love to I'll do that. Connected. okay sounds great so Connie well thank you very much for your time and we'll return to the meeting right here to wrap up all right thanks friends See thank you, you Connie great job Connie hashtag thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay God. all right bye bye um, okay people so as far as um, to wrap up the meeting let's see um, Oh yeah. Uh, do we have any more content actually from development, development-wise? Any more CAD assets or anything that we did not cover so far in a meeting? Josh, do you have anything? Uh, I know. Oh yeah, Abe. Abe, you did the PTO motor. Uh, that's good. That's great. That's that's the kind of PTO PTO motor that we're gonna use. Um, yeah, I've been trying to add some more parts there and uh, correct some of the stuff on the the cat on the tractor because I think there's a few things that are that are just off, and so a number of things need to be adjusted. I believe that includes the tracks to the point. That I've been having certain bugs or I need to do a dive today I think into FreeCAD to figure out why some of the things in FreeCAD sometimes work the opposite of the way I think they should but I, I have some of it is bugs and some of it is probably my workflow not being ideal because mm -hmm. uh, some, sometimes the parts and stuff trying to arrange that there in the master CAD I have stuff disappearing on me and different issues but the tracks have been a little difficult and I know that they're the wrong size and I'm a little concerned when those are properly positioned over the idlers that mm -hmm. it actually looks like they're going to bump into the uh, arms because uh -huh. uh, there's not a lot of space there so once those are pushed out of course I guess there's options we could uh, decrease the wheelbase or something depending but I think more wheelbase is ideal right so yeah 42 uh, inch yeah, wheelbase so. uh 41, 42 inch wheelbase is the ideal. That's that's copying the Toro Dingo value. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'd have to adjust some of the CAD stuff and uh, extend the arms or, or whatever is necessary there. That will change some of the, the weight balance of the two, I guess, kind of like that the bucket. But um, yeah, I was trying to arrange the motors and everything on there correctly and I'm having a little trouble with that but I did get the PTO motor done and I've almost got the the mounting plate not I don't know that PTO motor has some torque on it but I, yeah it does um I'm not sure what the flow is I, I don't think that the plate needs to be that heavy but I I, I, I half inch plate with, um, half inch plate is the standard for a lot of things that would be half inch so here's the hydraulic yeah. motor that's that's pretty much how it looks it's got a six six spline so this is the kind of motor yeah. where like if it has a six spline it's a standard agricultural spline you attach all kinds of implements to it so on the micro track we could put it on the front right on the right on the loader 
or you can also put on the back but not really on the back because the person is back there you'll get wrapped up in a PTO motor and then I also see a little mounting plate that you did uh, which looks like that so that's essentially let's see what you got it looks like you got about half inch there or something um, yeah. basically the motor is going to be there and this is the holes for the tubing where that would go be attached to the tubing so that's that's all good um, yeah I wasn't sure how many bolts it needed because obviously the torque I mean if you use some heavy bolts maybe three is too much but um, yeah two bolts two bolts like one on each end because the middle one is just going to be a pivot anyway the ones on the, the two on the two ends are what we really need yeah. there I had assumed that would go on the back, but I suppose on the tractor, yes. Kind of in the way, so I don't, I don't know where to put that on the front. So exactly this, other than yeah, well, this is relevant for the bigger tractor where you have tubing on the back and you can attach stuff at the back. So, but obviously for the micro track, the person's walking behind that. So, but you can put it on a on the front. Like for example, if we make a a bobcat attachment that's just got like the tubing plate on it for mounting other things like this that are bolt on you know that's one way to do it it's it's good I mean we can use this somewhere um, you know like say you got the tubing accessible anywhere so this may not be explicitly say for the micro track but we can definitely use this for other applications and so forth mm -hmm. there might be a way to fit it on the front let's see in between there, uh, behind the bobcat attachment plate, but I'm not. It would have to be oriented differently. Yeah, yeah. There's different ways to do. And here, just one detail on this: this sharp corner here. We might want to trim that since that's not doing anything. Uh, that yeah, could be trimmed to make I, it round. Little details. Just um, round it off. Yeah. Yeah, you can round it off. And okay, so let's talk about. Um, role allocation here so who's available to do various things let's see um, so let's see Ahmed you're, you're on a call here or Ahmed do we have Ahmed looks like we don't I'll, I'll continue with him on, on the continuing on the torch table and then also Lex let's see if we can uh, I'd like to see if I can follow up with you on the CNC torch table but the, the main thing on a on a CNC torch table, uh, the video recording is here for people to watch what we've talked about. And um, the the pivot right now, as in switch, is do plain one inch shafts. So make the first table, in order to just keep it simpler, make the first table five feet by five feet using all one inch solid rod solid shaft uh, that simplifies over the using the three-quarter inch pipe which is 1.05 inches and therefore would require a different bushing system so let's keep it easy for now make it a little smaller we'll work everything out with that and it's still very useful because four by four feet can cut out you know you can cut out all your track pieces out of that kind of area and then you can just shift the steel move it under again so it's a little more work but acceptable for for initial prototyping um, so I'm gonna see if I could add Lex to that Lex um, can I get you going on that like did you watch the video by any chance yeah I did uh, I watched the video so you just have to let me know which parts aren't done yet um, I actually I played on a little bit with doing the pulley the double pulley um, but I don't know what what specifically which part is already done and which is it didn't look like yeah um, uh, I didn't see any new parts on, right on the part catalog so right. I assume nothing's been done exactly not. if you don't see it it's not there so let's see where's that video whoa is that where's that video uh first print oh yeah there this video right here I'm gonna paste it in that's the latest working video where Ahmed and I we met up on that there um so video is is that and a video I think should have links does it have links to the working page no but the working page on a log would would naturally be the D3D CNC torch table that's that's the name 
and uh, you see some of this info. I, I go through a lot of this on the, in the video itself, so you can take a look at that. But what, whatever you see in a part library here, which should be linked, includes the part, the, in the links, there's the part library. The part library, that's all we have right now. Whatever is in there, is in there, except for there was a little change that Ahmed did to the carriage plate. Not not carriage, the, the, the motor plate. What we were trying to do is, like for the double pulley, we have to basically widen out, make sure that the hole is such that the carriage piece uh, can accept the double pulley. Like, and I think Ahmed did that. I, I have uh, on my screen, if you look at... Uh, that's his modification so far as it looks. Now he hasn't uploaded it to his log, which I asked him to do that. Otherwise, nobody can collaborate here. So this is the just the latest on what we do have, wh where the double pulley it mounts on a motor, but it would have this structure would have enough space that the double belt can actually squeeze in between there before it was more shallow. So I think that's actually correct. But now the thing that I'm seeing missing here, this still does not have the um, the three nut catcher bolts that are discussed you have to have the nut catchers this if this is the motor and if this is the axis that goes in between two other axes you have to do it by these three side nut catchers and this is building upon Michelle's uh, initial designs from last year so we're continuing with that with three bolt um, bolt holes here to make this work out um, Lex, does that provide any more additional insight to what has to be done? Because this was the first piece we were mount, we were working on, the and that can actually go in parallel with with designing the carriage as discussed in the video itself. So yeah, the video does have a to do list. So I mean, I'm not uh, confused about what needs to be done. I guess uh, the main thing actually is finding the dimensions for things. For example, for example, the double pulley. I can't figure out how wide it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, we made a comment like within the video itself, which is it's, if it's going to hold two six millimeter belts, it's six millimeters twice plus that little space in the middle. So you kind of have to guess it unless, I mean, it's, you know, unless we find a, an actual specific CAD file of it, you kind of have to guesstimate and just make it that it looks like it will fit. So that's the only thing I can say unless we find the actual file where. A lot of times we just can't find uh, specific dimension drawings for some of these parts. So, yeah. Okay. Um, but there is a to-do list within the video and a document, like the working document for the CNC, D3D CNC torch table that does have yeah. a, a, basically the next steps and all that. So this is the... Is that this working document? I think it's this working document yeah, here. It's in the middle of it. Yeah. Somewhere in the middle, there's a. Yeah. To -do yep. List. Yep. There's a details yeah, right there. to do list right in a document on a D3D CNC torch table. So, uh, basically, Ahmed log is the place where it's happening, and now Lex log. So, so I'll put those notes here. Um, And then you're pumping all that info to the D3D CNC torch table page, wiki page, and which is linked to the part library. So always update the update the part library as soon as you have anything. Put it on your own log and then update the part library for the normal workflow. And then Lex also added a burn down, which is awesome. So we're getting our infrastructure for project management. We can add the burn down. You can maybe do a test case of adding the burn down to that project too. But for that, we have to copy and paste the development template, so we have a burn down to work from. Uh, so join the the CNC torch. Um, let's see. So Roberto is available, and some of the next priority items would be. Um, how are we, Josh? Are you? Have you done? Any other bobcat female part? So yeah, I, I was looking at that, and uh, so there's the male one is already in there, correct? Yeah, and the male. See, the male needs to be finished too, and maybe that's something. Um, 
something we can get Roberto on that. But the female is what we need from you. Okay. Um, so we still need that female part of the Bob Bobcat Center. And does that make sense to you? What exactly? What's the limit? What's the scope of what you have to do? Yeah, that makes more sense. I, I wasn't sure. You know, there's kind of the two sides of it. So the female side, you're talking about. Yeah, it's kind of got the one that's got the two arms to kind of snap into place and lock the lock the. That's the, the male part. That's the male part you're talking about. Okay. So the female part is just. Yeah, it's basically more of a plate, right? Mounting yeah, plate. yeah. Um, the okay. male part is already on a micro track, but it does not have the detail. But it it has it has correct. So what we have on the CAD on the micro track is correct for the profile shape. Okay. Profile. Of the male quick attach but the detail with the latch is not there so somehow we have to add that in there and the quick attach that that latch thing which is a pin that goes in but it's under the pads you yeah this is something where Roberta if, I, I'd like you to do that because I'm actually gonna be traveling tomorrow's Wednesday I actually got to go out Wednesday Thursday Friday to to Utah to get the brick press up and running so because they're they're gonna be doing a, a demo day with that I need to help them out on that so I won't be available to do this but I definitely want to get you going so look at how Roberto look at how people do just find some pictures on the net there is a picture of that on our wiki page when you when you look at some of the supporting information on the quick attach standard look at how just research how they do the the locking pin and put it into the actual drawing of the of the bobcat quick attach the pin locking mechanism meaning there's going to be a lever with pin where when you turn that lever it will push the pin inside it will push that downwards so you lock in and implement and you kind of have to look at maybe what I'd like you to do is um, because this is an important detail that a lot of people have to understand like if you find videos on that uh, post them on um, post them on the Bobcat standard page uh, and once again, the Bobcat Quick Attach Standard. Uh, you can look at that, search Bobcat Quick Attach on the, on the wiki, and that's right there, Bobcat Standard Quick Attach. And it has like all these drawings and everything, so you can pick up some good information from there. And this is what we did actually uh, three or four years ago, but this is not really... Uh, not really robust. The difficulty of this is just the two points. It was kind of hard to lock the implements in on this thing. But basically, this is the pin I'm talking about. It's something like that, but it will have to be a little different. So please add the full documentation on how we actually implement this. So link to some videos so people can understand that more intuitively. And then try to see if you can find any other other supporting documentation so that we can draw it so actually research it and actually draw it out in full so uh, that's all I can say for you right now I have uh -huh. a question yeah about the uh, Bobcat is what is the um, like uh, around here where I live it almost everyone has John Deere's and, and Kubota's and those types yeah. of tractors yeah uh, that's a different standard than the Bobcat right yeah yeah it's different the so Bobcat they, is more of a construction thing as opposed to uh, agriculture or farming. Yeah. Is that is, is that um, like why is one more useful than the other? Or why was one decided? For yeah, like? yeah. It's um it's useful in that there's a lot of very standard implements around. So if if the micro track is more of a utility machine, then that's useful for that. Now, okay. the good thing about you know. So in, this is interface design. If you have the Bobcat standard, 
you can put on an interface plate where you have a you mount another plate with another mounting standard onto that so just because you have one it doesn't mean you can't use the other implements it means that you're gonna have to put on another another interface plate that now oh now I can connect to all all John Deere implements for example so it's still flexible enough that that we can do it uh, and I think the the good thing about it is I think the sheer numbers of implements that are out there like there's a whole world of construction and 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 utility devices I mean it's I don't know the exact numbers but I would suppose it's probably more than the agricultural implements because the agricultural implements typically a, a farmer has a forklift a bucket a grapple that's kind of like it I suspect there's actually way many more bobcat implements out there than uh, than tractor implements so and I actually don't know the numbers maybe we can look that up somewhere somewhere we can find it but it is a very popular system that I can just tell you that once someone hears that, they're like, oh yeah, uh, that's good, because uh, a lot of people just simply recognize that. Yeah, and because that it's such a such a widespread standard, and then there's a bunch of more of others, uh, that's that's why I'm saying it's it's the most recognized one out there, from as far as I can tell. Um, so now let's talk about, so we've got the, the male fingers that are already on a, on a micro track that we have. The female side is basically a receptacle. It looks like a square, like, okay, I'll draw that up um, right here. So that would look like this. It's, uh, it's basically like the top part of it. It's got the thing, like the latch, the finger, the bottom, the bottom side of that. Uh, it's hard to draw it, but there's gonna be a pin the pin holes on the bottom are gonna be here like where the pins go through and And so forth and it's a certain dimension like 42 inches wide for the whole thing But the top part here is the latch latch latching part where the male fingers go underneath that and and grab onto that And now the thing is this kind of a plate structure you can attach whatever implement you have like this for example would go on the back of the bucket that that Roberto has already created so we would put one of these kinds of structures the thing that the that the male part can attach to onto any implement so you can have one of these that can be welded onto any implement or it could be welded to an interface plate or our square tubing so if you want to attach things through bolts through our square tubing you can weld on the square tubing to this structure and so forth but once again you gotta research that um, it's out there you just gotta gotta research it uh, so that that covers that let's see Abe um, let's see Abe you, you want to keep working on some of the details um, maybe the specific details are to uh, one one thing is the trackpad itself so so take um, generating the actual CNC cutting files for the trackpad is uh, one of the things we definitely have to do for the event so maybe um, make sure we've got so basically pretty much open source the trackpad meaning uh, draw it very specifically like the one in the model is not I don't think it's exactly correct because it doesn't have that notch cut out at the bottom do you, you know what I'm talking about Abe um, so update to some the, degree the uh, track pad um, essentially what we have just to draw it quickly is we've got something like this um, we've got so each one of the track pads looks kind of like this where there's a two holes in it uh, like one here and one in the back yeah. there's one in the back this is not drawn dimensionally correct but what I'm talking about is this part right here that flat part the way it works when you what it has to be recessed up a little bit 
in other words uh, it has to be we, we have to cut out like this here because otherwise it will hit it will hit the next trackpad and it won't be able to like there's there's gonna be physical conflict there so we we need to notch it out like a quarter inch over there and update all the files for that otherwise okay. the so do that and beyond that I think the trackpads are actually pretty much correct and maybe like since we don't need that to be square and we're cutting this out with CNC we can possibly just like round out the corner here and this corner was also rounded out a little bit I just kind of like round out the corners and notch out this since this is going to be now CNC cut it doesn't have to be square so yeah yeah I guess it'd be try to get it somehow symmetrical because obviously you want to pack as much of this stuff in as you can onto a single sheet of steel. Exactly. Yeah. You want to, I yeah. saw that application the other day that does the SVG uh, nesting what do you call it? The packing quarter. Yeah. Um, can you use that? It would be nice actually if you can nest it in the, in the nesting application. Yeah. Nesting. Um, yeah. It looks like there's quite a few plates that that could be designed a little more efficiently. Yeah, and if you yeah, and if you're doing that, please do a quick screenshot of that workflow of how you take that application and do the nesting. Uh, quick screencast of that, because that's I mean yeah. that's a you know like that what? nesting part that's that's can be a big pain if you if you don't have the tools to do it because then doing it manually will take you forever. So so that nesting application that actually Michelle pointed out is actually very useful yeah. yeah I've seen different software that does that but that online one works good yeah. um, although I guess the DXFs because we, we export to DXF to do the cutting um, I uh, think it could uh, be I DXF or SVG the, yeah the nesting app uses takes vector graphics so I, I assume there should be some conversion uh, capabilities for that SVG to DXF, I believe that happens in Inkscape. So, yeah. okay. so as long as you have either DXF or SVG, we're good. But if you do end up with F SVG, complete, continue on that workflow, researching that, just to show exactly how we do that then within Inkscape, and it'll be just a simple export. Um, I haven't played with that yet, because last time, remember, we got we were nesting the stuff within. Um, within FreeCAD, well actually in Q, uh, QCAD, no, not QCAD, LibreCAD, but we ran into just bugs in LibreCAD that at that time I got totally stuck without thinking, oh, well we have Inkscape. I thought it was, uh, I, I didn't uh, get to the Inkscape at that time uh, because it's probably something I have to, you know, experiment with and work out as well. So I never had the time, but this time around we should make that available so it's a, another ready tool chain that we can we can apply and as you see there's just a lot of different tool chains we need to be on top of to, in this work mm -hmm. so that would be that would be good um, yeah anyone else has, has got any ample spare time to to commit I think everyone else is taken for the the work that they have I'm not aware of anyone else who can do stuff right now. Michelle, continue on this beautiful work here. Maybe Lex, pipe in on that. Uh, but I think that's it. Let's see. Do we have any questions for today? Like um, any questions on the assignments or on the um, questions, comments? Let's see. So I see photos of the work done on a larger tractor, but not files on Wiki. Are these old? I see live track MasterCAD file in Sheet, but it's not linked on the other Wiki page. Yeah, the only place the live track MasterCAD is is in the MasterCAD spreadsheet right now. So that needs we need to start a page for the the live track itself, the the big tractor. Now the the way it works typically just for workflow and process management, we start with we we did everything on the micro track page. At a certain point, we started developing the the big live track, which relied on a lot of the same parts. But obviously, as soon as you have enough work on a big tractor then you got to start a new page to reflect that and here the proper names would be micro track and life track v uh 17.10 which refers to 2017 october 
10 is the 10th month. So version 17.10, we do want to set up a, a new page for the tractor itself. And we didn't talk too much about that um, yet. But yeah, definitely we need, we need to start a new page with all the development assets on it. Any other questions on assignments or anything? I guess it, look at the timeline. It, is the plan to do the micro tractor uh, and the live track uh, a build of those simultaneously or yeah, it is. together? It is. It's, uh, I mean, the timeline is uh, that's happening in a five days. So the first day is training and then there's four days. Let's see. So it's 26, oh. 27, 28, 29, 30. We got four days to build ourselves a couple of tractors. So um, we'll see how the workshop goes. Lex is going to that. That's going to be October 26 through 30. Big build happening. So that's why, I mean, you can manage to actually build two of them when all the parts are the same. Like, for example, all the power cubes are going to be the same. So there's a lot of common parts and therefore that's what even makes it feasible in the first place but uh, like on a big tractor we have to build a, a cab we've got to build different loaders and so forth well whereas the tracks and everything else they're going to be the same parts just different a little bit different configuration but that's how we can manage to to have these crazy builds in a short time Is the CNC work being done at OSC? Who's saying that? Abe. On the, after the 14th, the, the answer is yes. So the 14th and 15th, we've got the build of the, of the CNC torch. Man, that's coming up, not this week, but next week. So we've got essentially a week, over a week, to finish the design. We've got, that means we got to print the 3D printed pieces. Uh, we've already built a sample, somewhat of a sample of that torch table. So we basically got to uh, focus and document all of that. Uh, well, I mean, uh, get, get the 3D printed parts out. The double pulley is the only thing we're going to modify right now. And build, build it with the metal plates and, and the specific axis and adding the torch to that. So we, we've done a little bit of that kind of early prototyping on that. Um, we can do it and that's going to be the 14th and 15th. And yes, the answer is we are going to have that cut at OSE here. So that's that. Any other questions? no questions then we can get going so thank you everybody we will continue this so next next uh, Tuesday's meeting so please do the the various parts and we'll build out whatever we are developing here the bucket that Roberto did yeah that's that's good enough we can do that we can build exactly that uh, we need some more details, like for example, the tracks, the, the specific track cutting file. That's going to be like one of the main things that we're going to need because the tracks took just about all the time. Um, if we can get the tracks built uh, in a relative uh, efficient way, then we'll be far ahead uh, in terms of what we need to do. And uh, just one little thing I want to add. Last year we did, uh, for, there's that roller inside the track which which the sprockets ride on there's a roller like a chain roller and then there's a pin through that uh, the roller we can actually cnc cut ourselves out of half inch steel because that we did out of like xxh heavy wall pipe and we can actually cut that with cnc so basically cut a disc cut a uh, basically a, like a big washer out of half inch steel uh, half inch thick steel so actually Abe I'm gonna uh, put that on your plate there uh, do you know the roller I'm talking about yeah 
Yeah. So the roller we can CNC cut as well. So put that into the nesting as well. So we will cut out. And Lex, you know we're we're talking about the the rollers that we cut last time. Look, yeah. The only thing is, doesn't that seem inefficient? Because when you're cutting with a torch table, you have uh, some waste. And if you're cutting a pipe, that can be done. Uh, a yeah. Lot more efficiently. Except the pipe is about ten times more expensive because it's XX. This 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 pipe was, I mean, surprisingly expensive. So that's why we're trying to do that. And and then to you know, actually, when you think about the labor involved, the labor involved in cutting it, it's like five minutes a slice, whereas, you know, a few minutes at least. We're doing it on a bandsaw. Uh, so if you do it out of CNC, you're talking about maybe 20, 30 seconds. So there's also a huge time efficiency on CNC cutting those rollers. So definitely there's a case for that. Uh, and we definitely want to do that if we can do that. Otherwise, we'll end up cutting it and we can have basically have a person manning the the bandsaw uh cutting all those rollers uh for the packing order on the the arrangement the dxfs or svgs uh what is the kerf on that um uh you can call it zero i mean for practical purposes i mean it's really like one sixteenth of an inch or so but don't worry about it that's that's irrelevant if possible if possible nest them like right next to each other when there's a where's a flat side there's that's not a problem nest them next to each other uh, and when they're round if, if there's a bunch of discs being cut yeah. out you think that's not going to be an issue um for that because it's a point contact yeah it could be an issue so for the discs space them out by like uh Three eighths of an inch, not three eighths, maybe three sixteenths of an inch. So we make sure we we cut it properly. Yeah, leave like three sixteenths. Between discs. Yep. And I'm not sure how that nesting app works. I don't know if it lets you set. Yeah, it does. Distance between things. Okay. I think it does. It does. That that's the good thing about it, because typically if you go to a CNC cutter guy. In their software, it's typically preset because they they enforce that you get a certain separation, so we don't have that flexibility here. We we can um, set it to what we want. Mm -hmm. So that's that's so, it. I mean, the tracks the tracks are the main thing. That's like the most complicated thing. The power cube we're pretty confident in. I mean, that's that's going to work. We we know this one works really well. The one we designed last time. Um, except for this time around actually we um, an outstanding task is to put two outlets it's just a minor modification but um, if you're on a Abe if you're on a modification track we need to add a second uh, hydraulic outlet hydraulic suction to the power cube because we're gonna now use one power cube and, and use its reservoir for two two engines that's that's a little detail we have to we have to do as well yep um, and if we get any more energy we have to design I'm, I'm just putting it under your name but design the power cube basically cut off the without fan cooler hydraulic tank because basically we're going to do the second power cube engine like you see in the micro track you have the second smaller power cube that's going to be a power cube without fan cooler hydraulic tank so basically cut off those parts off the um, off the file we're going to have to do that as well we do want to get that before the workshop so we're not working out of thin air that we're working from a CAD file so yeah those are things that need to be done for the the actual build and it's also acceptable that like because we said the the, the micro track we're going to do 16 horsepower but we also want to demonstrate that we can put that second power cube on it pretty much readily to get 32 horsepower that's the idea there which is like a lot for a small tractor like that we can run some heavy implements on the front and stuff like that okay so let's let's quit here that plenty of tasks to do if anyone um, is out of tasks, there's enough tasks on this list here. If someone gets something finished and you want to jump into the other one, uh, the, the basic idea is if it's not on a wiki, it doesn't exist, so do it. 
In other words, if you go to a person's log or the uh, log, you go to the person's log. If it's not documented there, it means it's not done and you can take that task on. So uh, that's the way we can collaborate universally here to, so that we don't repeat people's others, others' work. Okay, uh, let's quit here. It's a long meeting. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Good work. Uh, great stuff coming forward. I would say, uh, once again, congratulations on a Lyman film and extruder. I think the documentation we produced was awesome. Well, we wrote a lot off the, the existing documentation, but some of the documentation that we did clarified a lot of different things. And uh, build was nice. Not finished yet, but we'll continue on that. And thanks for everything. We'll continue and build the team. Take care, guys. Bye.